and uh, that's uh, that's about as big a fuel, big about as big a load as you're going to get right there. So you could, you'd have three bombs on each. Yeah, we carry six. Yeah, yeah, we carry six bombs, and then we carry either one or two missiles. Now, see where the canopy is? Okay, just look down to the right into the low part of the canopy. There's a hole there, kind of a, a bubble in the in the skin of the airplane. That's where the gun fires from. And it fires pretty rapid. There's an F-14 right there. That's a Navy F-14. What's the best type of plane that they have now? The F-16. That's the one he flies. No, but I mean... No, that's a... Uh, well, it, it depends on what you... Because uh, they only have, like, eight, eight, eight missiles. They only have eight missiles. Okay, this guy's going to be full stopping up here. We won't be able to see him, but we'll wait for the other four to come in. Thank you. Big change crew. Plus on nine, all right? This is, these are C-141s right here. These are cargo airplanes. They're not fighters. We can we can go here. He's going to land it. You see him. Remain my brakes. Keep my land full stop. Five hundred. Keep clear to land on that right when comes. Right. That can slow down. He just keeps his nose up like that so he can aero brake. He uses the airplane to brake as much as he can. They they they're going a lot faster than they go. Yeah, well, we, 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 we fly final approach in our F-16 about 145 to 155 knots, and we touch down about 140. That's plane? That's his plane, that's right. In fact, I don't think he's on that. That probably is the press because we had a ramp freeze and we had to land in formation this morning because uh, it went real fast with 2,000 feet remaining, then I've got to figure out something about getting another hook down to try to get me stopped or getting down on the brakes harder, but the runway's marked off like that. Plus. If you look just to the left of the, see just to the left of the eight there, you see that big yellow mm -hmm. circle? Yeah. You guys see it? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. That's That also tells me that that's where the barrier is. So if I'm landing, I'm... You don't hit it. You don't go over that unless you're about to wreck. I mean, I mean, oh, no, I land over it every time. I land, uh, if I if I can land on this first brick up here, I'll do that every time because uh, you just kind of get good at landing it and using all the runway and landing as short as you can on the one. So you got the whole runway in case. That's, uh, that's where the president's airplanes are kept. That's where he comes out and when he departs from here, there will be a series of helicopters that will come out and they'll land over there and he'll be in that hangar and then his airplane will come taxiing out and take off. And just to the right of that, that's the air, that's the terminal tower where he, there's a, a, a tower controller and a ground controller in there and they control everything that goes on on the surface of the, of the airport area here and in the traffic area above the airport. He's like an air traffic controller. So. You were about, were you going to Desert Storm? We were, we were ready to go and, and of course only two guard F-16 units went, Syracuse and uh, South Carolina, so we didn't get a chance to go. We, you got to sit here and watch it like everybody else. And you can see the numbers out on the runway there. See, there's a six, I mean a seven and a six and five. And those are real important to me when I land to make sure that I know, you know, whether I'm bleeding my speed down fat, down quickly enough to get stopped safely by the end of the runway. Well, the times that you've used that, you know, put your hook out and use yeah. that chain, did you have to or you practice? Oh no no you don't practice that. I, you, that's one you uh, that's one you only do it when you have to do it. The Navy does it. They practice it because that's a way of life of stopping for them. But we don't. So did your brakes failure one time in the F4? I had a uh, 
an engine failure in the F4. I had a drag chute failure in the F4 um, in, in the F105. See, in the F4, that airplane I showed you back down there, uh, because it landed so much faster and so much was so much bigger than the F-16, we had to have a drag chute that slows down. So when I'd land, when you'd see, you know, when he took... I don't have it all the whole time. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. They're probably talking to me and I'm probably shooting the breeze and I'm not hearing anything they're saying either. <laughs> Upset when I'm taxing around. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any idea. Let's see. Right. Being able to practice approaches. Yeah. I think we might as well do this. They were on it. Well, why will they let you cross over there? Why won't they? Why will they let you cross over the, that one and not on the other side? Mm, talk, you, the red line back there, you mean? Mm -hmm, yes, the red line. Um, well, they just have the red line laid out where they want it to be, and uh, that just sig again signifies an area that they uh, that they want to maintain security. Up. And I don't know why they lay them out like that. Ours, the way ours is, it's around the whole ramp except for two control points that we have. That's the only thing that... You can get out if you want, if you can take better pictures outside. No, I mean, no, no problem with doing it. You just wait for the tank off. Yeah, you just wait for the tank off. Let this guy take off. <laughs> well, this guy might be having a problem because there's, there's, I see the other guy's going around already. I don't know what his problem might be. Oh, I see he's just dragging. They're just going to land straight in.
How fast can they go? We can go 1.5 times the speed of sound, which is about 900 knots. Um, well, we're not doing anything. We're just going fast enough that the airflow actually goes uh, goes supersonic across the airplane, and it sets up what they call a bow wave, and that's a shock, basically a shock wave. That that's where you hear the sound. Right? But it's not uh, uh, it's not doing anything particular where that is. When supersonic air goes, it, it, again, it sets up this thing called a bow wave, and that's what gives the crack. The crack is boom. People get really mad if we go supersonic. Uh, it goes, it, it does this go boom once and then... Just one time. They're flying one, over, one boys. Time. Yep. When I landed this morning, I landed in formation. I have taken off here and requested an un unrestricted climb where I can take off an afterburner and the F-16 can actually climb vertically and actually go straight up in the air. Does it ever, I mean, what happens if you go too far? I mean, does it ever, hold on. Like, I know if I'm flying off. land in flights like that. We couldn't land that close behind another airplane. Uh-huh. Yep. What is it? I have no idea what it is. I'm not even sure there's not two. It might be two, but I don't think so. It looks like a single airplane. Oop, he just hit jet watch. See his wings wagging? He just hit the guy's, it's called jet watch. He just hit the curtain of the guy's side. You see, when he lands, you see him holding the nose up like that, and he does what we call aero braking. That means he's still holding the nose up so the airplane is still trying to fly, and it will cause it to slow down rather than, because the one runway is really wet right now, and uh, if you get down on the brakes real hard, you can Skid. We have an anti-skid system that, that every time just about I land, if I, if I jump down the brakes real hard, you can feel it cycle. You can feel it let the brake pressure off and on and off and on and on. And uh, so all of that's automatically done. But, uh, but we have to be a little bit careful on a wet runway like this because you can't uh, can get into a slide. So they try to get slow down. Yeah, that's an old C-130. All right, well, let's that go back. We look at you can get to look at them a little bit closer. Stuff and, uh, you have to type on a computer? Well, yeah, and I'll show you the computer head. It's not like a typewriter head, but I'll uh, I'll show you that when we get inside. But yeah, when I get in, I got to spend about 20 minutes of putting stuff into the computer and getting everything set up and checking the radar and checking the missiles and checking the gun and setting up the weapons and uh, it's a lot of different stuff that uh, that we have to do. And he's going through the shutdown now, so he's taking stuff out of his. Uh, He's getting the information out of inertial. I see that they didn't drop the bomb, so the weather was obviously too bad to get on the range. In fact, I think Shiv Kapoor is flying uh, Aircraft 500. He's one of the guys from uh, that was in Desert Storm. I believe he is. But you'll, I'll, we'll ride down here, and I'll show you two things. You know, here's the guy coming in right now. Nope, we've got the best at... We've got the best air conditioning system in the world. I can get in that airplane in the middle of hot summertime, close the canopy, start the air conditioner, start the engine, and the air conditioner comes on and I'm real comfortable. Does the outside of the airplane Yes, it does. It does. If it goes real, if we go real fast and real low, it will get the skin temperature will raise, it will rise, and the thing will get hot. Okay. 
<laughs> He's not like an SR-71 or anything like that. But, uh, well, yeah, because they're going real fast, and they're real high. Wouldn't it be hot No, no, it doesn't get that high, but you can feel the warmth of it if it's, uh, if it's, uh, you know, we've flown, you know, a particularly fast mission. Usually we don't fly that fast. I mean, we, we seldom break the sound barrier. In fact, there's only one place that we can do that. We go out over the ocean where we fly air combat and we'll fly, we can go supersonic out there. But you can't anywhere over the United States because people get really mad if you uh, break the sound barrier. Breaks windows and booms and a lot of other things that people don't like. Matter of fact, well, yeah, you'll, they'll, we'll boom sometimes. I've gone supersonic unintentionally a lot of times. But they're down in the arm area down there, so what they're doing is actually putting the pins in the missiles, in the bombs, and in the guns so that they can't fire. Nope, that's what we're flying air ghost in the Can you put this over though? Is it recording? Now it is. That's the VHF um, yeah, so. This is Captain Jeff Rins, one of our tough air to air guys out of our recent <laughs> operational rig. Okay. Almost fell off the ladder. <laughs> did a great job there. <laughs> <laughs> How you guys doing? Let's go. We'd walk around and look at some of the stuff while she puts the pins in the seat. These are bombs here. Don't you? Yeah, you don't want to touch them too much, but uh, they're pinned and they're okay because that little pin here keeps. Uh, this this is uh, called a tur, uh, tertiary ejector rack, I think is what it is. And, and when they uh, when we put real bombs, which we carried in the ORI, or you carry in war, they would go on these stations here in place of these blue bombs. Oh, they'd be a lot bigger. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they'll stick out about here. Well, they'll be about that big. Can you take off this right here? Um, can I like hit this and you hit this? Uh, yes, you could, because when, that, when, I, when I push this button to have the bomb drop off, then what it actually does is it comes down and it hits that piece right there in a big chunk. That bomb is built so that it flies just like a real bomb. Just if I were carrying a real one, except it's smaller, but its trajectory and its speed and its uh, performance is exactly like a real bomb. Well, um, it seems like when you're flying that fast, if I were to hit it, it would be just the same as the wind. Yeah, it would, but it, it's not enough pressure to actually, it's not enough to catch them. When they hit the ground, they're going about uh, about 480 knots. So when they hit the ground, they hit pretty hard. It's a lot harder than Here's the missile, of course. This, uh, I'll take the seeker head off here just for a second, but you can look, here's the, here's the eye, infrared seeker head right here, and that's what senses the heat source on the target, either another airplane or whatever I'm flying, usually other airplanes. And that's what it senses the other targets there. And, uh, this seeker head works. That's right. But there's no there's no motor in this missile. This is a this is a captive missile, and there's no motor or no uh, no rocket uh, propellant. Why did they put it on? Because we use the seeker head, so I can <coughs> simulate. I mean, if I go out, it, it it acts just like any other missile, and I can tell whether I fired or taken a good shot or not by coming back. And I'll show you how we can do that. Does Brian have enough questions? Okay. Let's see. That's called the no that's the nozzle part of the airplane, and, that, and you, if you uh, watch that when we're flying, that thing will be moving around, closing and opening, closing and opening, depending on what what, uh, what power I've selected. Sometimes an afterburner is wide open, and then uh, uh, then other times it'll be real closed. So, and, and it works automatically. There's a computer in there that runs that whole thing. Tinfoil, what does that do? That's for the radar. The radar, that's right. It'll, it'll, uh, it doesn't 
doesn't doesn't disturb the radar missile, but it will hopefully break the lock of the guy that's got me locked up in his radar. Did you learn or that at, at Space Camp? Did hmm? you learn that at Space Camp? No, ma'am. No, he learned it off infantry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, come on, let's hurry so they can get out of here. Okay. That's a good idea. All right. Uh, yeah, because we'll, let me sit in the seat because you guys, I'll get to sit in the seat with you inside. Okay, why don't you come up on the other side and be real careful. Yeah, because it's, it's all wet, so it's a little slippery. You can turn around and sit right down on that seat. See what he's going to tell you. Yeah, not a lot of room in here, but I can use Jimmy, you want the camera? I'm not going to come up. That's it, Jimmy. You can see now. So here's the button I push to drop the bomb clip right over here. And then here's the trigger that I squeeze to fire the gun. So you can see the Here's the problem. So, I'll tell you a lot more about what these things are when you get inside and get out of the Well, we call it play in the pickle because there's a lot of buttons on it. Here's the speed brake button right here. This controls my radar on tilt. This controls the missile arm or D arm. This controls the, the, uh, the radar switch that, uh, in what mode I want the radar. This is the UHF and the VHF button. Here's the slewing switch that I can slew cursors in the radar. And there's probably about three more other things on here, too. But, uh, here's this. You're right. This is the ejection. That's the G suit. No, that's my G suit. That's my G suit. Show that. I plug my G suit into that G suit when I'm pulling the nine G's. Pumps up around my legs and around here and helps me force against the G's. Here's the oxygen hose back here. That's the oxygen. Hose. And these are all radio. She just went up in there. <laughs> Whoa, somebody in there. <laughs> what do you mean? We are okay. We are okay. I've never seen anybody go up there like that either. <laughs> what are you checking for? They're just damn no, the fan blades? <laughs> You guys, why don't you listen to it? Because this is kind of interesting. I've never even seen this before. Tell them what you do. I look in here and see the first blade to make sure there's no nicks or, uh, or cuts or tears in the blades. And then I also check the, the gravel veins. The first stage comes through. They direct the airflow going on to the blades for the flow going through the motor and make sure there's no looseness in the bearings so that if the bearings are loose, you get too much uh, slop in them, you're going to get a misdirection of flow that causes an augmented blowout, compression stall. Which is something that I got to worry about. <laughs> no, uh, it's supposed to be a. It's supposed to be a. Uh, okay, who wants to get up in there? Why don't we get up in there? Go ahead. And I'll show you something. This is uh, this is what we call an emergency procedure trainer, and you can see it's set up with a lot of the cockpit stuff. Although some of the stuff is not real. We uh, we use this to uh, to uh, train emergency procedures. In other words, if uh, and you can see some of them right here, that each of these steps there, there's a fire over, fire over heat, uh, fuel leak on start, and there's a procedure we have to go, and we have to be able to do that real quickly, of course, and, and make sure that everything is, is uh, done properly and done quickly because it's an emergency procedure, and it's, it's what we call a critical action procedure, and consequently we've got to practice them to make sure we do them right when it's time to do them. But we'll sit, yeah, you, when you're sitting in here, no, we don't have any of that stuff in here. This is just purely to get your hands to move around the cockpit the way that uh, they're supposed to be in, a, in, a, in an emergency procedure. Again, it's practicing it slowly so that when it comes time to do it, you do it right, you do it quickly, and you do it properly. But it's pretty much set up the same way. The stick doesn't move like this in the airplane. The stick doesn't move, it's rigid in the airplane, so the stick doesn't move at all. You just put pressure on it, and it, and it uh, through the amount of pressure you put on it sends a signal to the electronic flight controls and it does, you know, tells the airplane what to do. Is this how you travel? No, uh, no, this, this is totally wrong. In other words, even like that comes out, I'd be real concerned if that happened to <laughs> Matter of fact, when I'm pulling 9 G's, I'm really pulling hard on this stick. And this is a landing gear. Look. That's a landing gear, yep. Yeah, it's in the up position, too. It's pretty scary. Huh? <laughs> go to the down position. But we use this to, to, uh, to uh, Put uh, you know do again to do the procedures. There's that hook switch. When I take that and put it down, that's when it blows that hook down at the back. 
So uh, let me just explain some of the things. You asked about the, 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 uh, the uh, throttle quadrant over there. And, and, uh, you can look at this, I and mean, there's a lot of different buttons on that thing. And that's why we call it playing the piccolo. And you'll hear a lot of times in the guy's heads up display tape, you'll hear him say a bad word because he's done something wrong with one of the switches and he's done it unintentionally. So it's, uh, it's kind of, a, you hear a lot of uh, words that you'd rather not. <laughs> Here today when we hear air tape. <laughs> Here's an interesting thing too. There's two ways we can release flares. The flares, remember we talked about? Right here, that button right there. When I'm going into a target and I do my pull-up, well, I'm banging on the side of that side of that uh, canopy rail there because I want those flares and chaff coming out a lot. When I'm up and exposed, remember I talked about being, when I climb up to get set up to do my weapons delivery, people are firing at me. I want them to have a lot of things to decoy their bad stuff away from me. That's flare switch. Flare switch. No, that's nose wheel steering switch and action range. Where's the other flare switch? It's on this button right here. It's, there probably isn't one on here, but there's a little pinky switch just below right here. That it's not on this stick, uh, but some of the other yeah. things have a little button. It's right there. Well, that's right. Well, well that's why we have that one. On. Is this what so your cockpit looks like? Yeah, except it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have, I mean, some of the things in here are fake, of course. Uh, but uh, this is the size and, uh, and, and the way it's laid out. Right, we'll get to see it better in the emergency egress for trainer. This is this is a procedure trainer here that, again, you go through the emergency procedure, so you touch the right buttons and do the right things that when it's in an emergency. Down there, we use that to practice egressing. Yeah. And you'll see, uh, we'll get in there and they'll put the canopy down and, uh, and you have to do it. Of course, they're never going to let you do it in the daytime. It's always going to be a night emergency, so you have to feel your way to get everything out. And, you know, <laughs> you'll, you'll hear the guy say, okay, and you'll see a light come on inside because it's opaque on the outside of the canopy. And then, then, of course, you see a lot of boom, 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 bang, 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 boom, boom. The guy's in there working, you know, working his little heart off, you know, trying to get out of there, you know. And, and, uh, and usually, if you can do it 14 seconds, you've done a good, pretty good job. What is it? Um, I know this is like... When they're, when they're landing, I don't, they, what do they do, like hold this down? No, no. Nope, you don't touch that button in the F-16. In other airplanes I've flown, you trim. You do a lot of trimming, what we call trimming. That's moving the control surfaces so that they... Do they have this in the F-16? Sure they have it. And, and I can still trim, but I don't... Usually the computer in the F-16 trims for me. So I just fly... I, I keep my finger away from that button. So I fly there. I mean, I'll always keep my finger on it, but I don't touch it. I don't move it very much. What is this button? That button is, uh, it does two things. It's, uh, it's an action reject to break lock on a target that I've got locked up in the radar or to designate a target that I want locked up. So, so if you're, okay. right when you push up, it's locking No, when I, when I see a target on the, on the radar scope, and you'll see, you'll, I'll show you what I mean when we get to my tape. When I see a target on the radar scope, you'll see these little things called curtains come squiggling over towards it. And then when I get those boxes around, when I get that little box, there's two little lines around the target that I want to try to lock up, I'll push that button and it'll say, ah, there's something he wants locked up. So boom, it goes out and tries to lock that thing up if it's a target. It may not be a target. And then you sort of go, once you lock it up, then you go, Nope, then I don't I don't do very much of this stick over there. I'm doing a lot of that one over there though, and I'm doing a lot lot of watching that little television scope right there, because that's the radar scope. Maybe I'll show you that. It's cool. Dog fight. Yep, that's the dog fight mode. Those are the modes of the radar. Inside I mean inside goes into a, a missile override, which means that I can no matter what air to ground mode I've selected, I might have I might have air to ground stuff up here let me know that I'm getting ready to deliver weapons against the ground. And I'll say, yikes, there's a guy in front of me that I don't want to be there. And I can go inboard to missile override, which means it calls up my missiles on either wing, or I can go outside. That is called the dogfight mode, which says that I can either go to air-to-air -air missiles or I can fire the gun at him. So a lot of things on there that I can do. And again, that's playing at piccolo, and you're, uh, you're trying to make sure that you push the right button and squeeze the right thing. And, and when you have a, what y'all call a, a lock on, is that locking your jet, or is that locking your uh, firing, whatever it is, the target? It's, it, when I say I've got a lock on that means that I've got, I've got a target of another airplane out there, and I've designated I want that guy absolutely tracked on my radar. Usually, usually you see my radar going back and forth sweeping. Oh, okay. So that's locking and you'll see targets radar. over here and targets yeah. over there and down here. And when I go here and go boom bang and lock that guy up, it'll, it, then the, mar the, the target goes, I mean, the radar goes into uh, one of two modes, uh, uh, both of which are locking the target, but one of them is a single target track, which 
uh, that says that I don't care about anybody else. All I want is that guy right there, and it'll tell me a lot of stuff about that guy. It'll tell me, tell me how high he is. It'll tell me how fast he's going. It'll tell me what direction he's going. It'll tell me whether he's high aspect on me, meaning whether he's pointed to me, pointed at me, or pointed away from me, or pointed across this way. So I get a lot of information from that radar, a lot more than we ever got in any other airplane. I mean, usually, usually before in the F-4 and the F-105, they'd say, yeah, there's a guy out there, and he's, he's out there somewhere, but you didn't know how <laughs> high he was, you didn't know how fast he was going, you didn't know what he was doing to you, and now we, all of it's right in front of me. So that's locking your radar. Yep, it sure is. I'm locking, I'm locking up a target. That's yeah. a better way to think of I'm locking up a target. If you like um, using this, why don't you let Jeremy get in there? Yeah, Brian, hop out and let Jeremy sit Yeah, you hop out and let him sit in there. That's called the throttle cutoff. I can't I can't shut the engine down without using that pinky switch. Probably a good thing to have on there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you jerk that thing to eye, we can get jerk it to cut off. Yeah, watch it, let him get out. That's right. Just be real careful there. <laughs> the first time we went out to get try the F-16, we we went out to the airplane about three or four times to find out the most gracious way to get into it. We were all experimenting <laughs> on how the most gracious way to get into it. It's not a very easy airplane to get into. <laughs> you can reach all the way back to those things right there? Uh, well, that mine do, sure. Mine fit down here. Every airplane I've ever flown, Jeremy, I've had to have the rubber pedals all the way out. I've had to have the seat all the way down so my head <laughs> didn't hit the canopy. Uh, I've got a unique problem that a lot of guys out there that you'll see won't have that. And you won't have that problem for a while. No, that's, that's, yeah, that's the one that drops the flares. That's exactly right. Drops the flares and chaff out of the back. And that's, remember the flares, like uh, like Brian said, when the flares go out, that's when I'm trying to avoid a heat-seeking missile. And when the chaff is there, that's when I'm trying to drop that guy's lock that's out there. What is, what is this right here? So the U also the panel that throws all the, all the lights on in here. These lights will come on, so I can sit back here and say, okay, what do you do if this happens? And I'll push the fire warning light. The fire warning light will come up here, and the guy's got to go through his critical action procedure for fire warning. So when you uh, are detecting a target, do you also know when someone else has locked you as a target? Is yeah. there any kind of? Yeah, there's a, there's a little system on board you'll hear, you'll be able to hear an uh, audible or radar warning receiver that tells me that somebody's out there looking at me. And, uh, when and they lock you on as a target, then is that when you send out all the debris and the flares and everything? No, to not, not then usually. It's when I get into, uh, when you get there's a couple of reasons. Well, when it's <laughs> getting close, to, obviously the flares come out when I see somebody fire something at me. I want to make sure that he's uh, that I can beat that, but uh, I won't put chap out. Uh, there are a lot of different times I'll put it out, and I'll tell you about it. But yeah, there's a way I can. Is that screen up there, like pretending like you? Well, that's a screen. I think that's a computer screen up there that has lessons or something on it. We never use that. We just have a guy sitting back there, and he'll put lights on, and I've got to got to go through the emergency. Security and classified stuff is in there. When we go in there. They will they give us all the intelligence rundown on what our threat's going to be, the people that are out there that we're going to be flying against. They'll tell us what our target is. They'll tell us all about the threats around the target, what it's going to, what they're going to try to do to us. And we all go in this locked room, and, and, and they have a lot of classified information there. But you can see the door, that, that door is equally as thick as this one here. So mm. it's, a, it's not open now. So It's not, <laughs> not everybody. OK. This is where we go to the airplane. Well, we can get by without lights. Matter of fact, it'll be more fun when you try and get out of this. Get all my stuff out, and I'll put it on. I'll let you put it on. And that's my helmet up there. That's right. Here's my helmet liner. Here's my gloves. All that checklist and stuff that I got. And I've got my G suit with me. And I'll uh, show you how all this stuff goes on. Matter of fact, it would be even better if you guys put it on. <laughs> Let me. Okay, Brian, here. You you put it on. Have you already put one of these on? The harness? And this is the, I'll bet we can get two more. We can get one of these and Jeremy can put one on. Well, it's pretty heavy. That's what you sit down on. Let's see. We'll use John Camp. Oh, I think you're a little bit bigger. <laughs> Here's one. Here, you put this on. I'll tell you what these things do. Here, this has to go up. This goes on like this, first of all. And then this closes up like this. And then 
And then the leg straps go one here and one on the other side. Get that. This comes through like this. These would be a lot tighter on the guy that we wear. And I'll show you how tight mine is on me when I get up because you absolutely don't want to get out of this thing. <laughs> That's a light jacket. That's exactly what that is. And when I come down in the water in a parachute, when I hit the water, whether I pull these things or not, as soon as I hit the water, there are sensors in here that sense brackish water or salt water, and it'll automatically inflate those things in case I'm not conscious. When I come down, if I'm unconscious, it'll automatically come up and it'll come around my neck and keep my head afloat. What about regular? Not supposed to land in fresh water, are well, you? <laughs> But if you landed in a lake, that, that's a good question because if you landed in a lake that doesn't have salt water in it, you'd be a problem. But the fact is, you would have rain problem then too. So every time you got in the rain, you might find yourself with the May West around your neck. So that's a very good question, though, and uh, and I think the answer is no, that it won't work in in fresh water. What do you do there? Well, if it doesn't work, now I pull these things. Don't pull them, please, but, uh, because it'll get real big around you. <laughs> okay, and that's how the that's how the harness goes on. Y'all see that I'm quite a bit bigger than you are, so it's, uh, it's going to be a lot more. And it has to be real secure around me because when I when I eject from the airplane, because I'm going real fast, or potentially going real fast, I could potentially be going up, you know, upwards of 400 or 500 knots, which I would want to do at 500 knots. I try to slow the airplane down. But once I initiate the ejection, everything is automatic after that, and all of a sudden I'll find myself out in the parachute. And of course I'll run this thing. No, no, I hope I don't. If I do, I've got real trouble then. All of it's supposed to be automatic, but if it doesn't, I mean, I know how to do it if, I, if it doesn't happen automatically, but it should happen automatically. Every, in fact, I, as soon as I come out, the next thing I ought to know is when I'm out in the chute, the chute's up there above me and I'm coming down. Have you ever had to eject? I've never had to eject. We just had a guy eject about uh, three months ago out of an airplane, though, that lost the engine and he ejected. And he only went out at 300 feet above the ground and he came down in a, in a, in a, uh, a river in North Carolina, in the uh, in matter of fact, behind uh, uh, the Outer Banks, there's a place called Albemarle Sound. I don't know if you know the geography down there. Now. You know where that is? Mm -hmm. He came down in Albemarle Sound, actually the mouth of the Alligator River, where that comes out into uh, oh, the sound. That's really cool. So he was real lucky to, to uh, get out of that thing for one thing. Okay, yeah, how beat? That's, that's low. real low. Yeah. That's real low. He came out way too late. He should have. Uh, he should have come out much earlier. Um, I'll show you how those things go. <laughs> you gotta put your, you gotta put your red hat on. <laughs> That's what all the red baron. <laughs> keep that down over your ears, and then here. This is. <laughs> put this over your mat, over your face now. And see that? Of course, that's going to be a little bit tighter on me too. It's like a little baby <laughs> elephant. <laughs> Dumbo. Where are your ears, Dumbo? Hey, boy, it looks like an elephant. I know. <laughs> I thought it was a hatch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, camper's helmet's a little bit different than mine, but uh, there. Pretty heavy, huh? What is that? That's the oxygen hose. That goes, that's which? Oh, that's the mic cord. Uh, along with my oxygen hose. Can you breathe okay? <laughs> I don't want to, we'll be talking, all of a sudden you'll go boom. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, look at me. So you take these things off and pull the visors down. I always fly with the visors down in case I hit a bird and the bird comes through with me. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> now you all really yeah, look I've like heard birds something, before, man. all right. You all look like feet from the deep. <laughs> <laughs> You've hit birds, have they come through the windshield? No, they didn't come through the windshield. Make you jump back out of it. They make you get real <laughs> loose, I'll tell you. They're going, they aren't going very fast, but I'm going real fast. Okay, let me tell you about the G suit here. That's a, this is a G suit that I wear. No. This one, I probably wouldn't even be able to put it on you, but because uh, it's pretty big. But when I wear it, we put them on like this. That's all right. It probably scratched. I hit it on the when I was getting out of the airplane. Hit it today. This I have to put all this stuff on before you can go out to fly. And uh, this one's a real important one, particularly like we were talking about with the G induced loss of consciousness. 
You can, yeah, here. Go like this. Here. You get claustrophobia, Brian. You okay? You all right? Want to take it off? We had to wear those things. We had to wear those things with the masks up at summer camp one day for six and a half hours. Mm. Gosh. Because, because we were simulating, we were simulating the fact that our base was under a chemical attack. And those were simulating our chemical uh, masks, our chemical ensembles. So we had to leave those things on for six and a half hours. Mm. And we got to be wild too. But this, this uh, well, when, when you when you've got the mask on, of course, it's plugged into the intercom system, and the radio is plugged in, that, so you could hear the guys talking on the radio when we were in the truck in there, and you'll be able to hear them later. But that's that's how you talk to them. When we were talking, I could barely hear myself. Yeah, well, that's right. That's one of the problems. That's one of the one of the things that they were trying to force us to do was to be able to talk and be able to still communicate, even though we were under a chemical attack environment. So we had to still be able to work and function and go ahead and operate, I mean, even though we were under chemical attack. So it's kind of a challenge, I'll tell you. This G-suit is the thing I talked about. If you feel in here, there are bladders that are that, that pump up in here, and this this hose plugs into that hose you asked me about on the side there. And when when I go into a tight turn, when I'm looking when I'm looking to fight an adversary, you really real tight? boy, you bet you can. Because when I pull hard, that thing goes <laughs> and pumps up real big. And this bladder here pumps up. And what that does, if you've uh, have you ever lifted weights? Okay, did you ever? They have a weight belt. This is kind of like a weight belt. Where you get to push against it, and you grunt, and you grunt real hard, and that keeps your blood pressure up enough so it keeps the blood up in in your in your uh, in the upper part of your body. And when they were telling us about it, they were telling us that, you know, the only unfortunate part of being able to pull nine G's is that your head, your head is getting kind of woozy because the blood's coming out of you, but your feet are ready to go to war. <laughs> there's a lot of blood in those feet. Uh, All right. Does this go under the G's? No, that goes, well, that, it doesn't even, uh, I just put the harness on and, and it, the, the harness doesn't really, yeah, doesn't really come down. You want to get that out? Watch this. Here's, oh, here's, there's a lot easier way to do that. Like that. Watch this. Here's, this is a lot easier. Just take it, pull that, it comes right out. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Got to tell you that. <laughs> okay, let me get all these things sorted what, what back out. Right Let's see which number is that. Let's see, Brian had mine. I had I didn't ask before you just leap up here. He's mad at me. Next time he comes out, my stuff's laying all over the place. He's real mad. He's our PE specialist. He's the guy that's uh, responsible for all of these, uh, making sure all of these helmets and uh, and all this stuff is in good work. Okay, let's get in. Go ahead, start. Okay. What is it? This is what you call trampoline. <laughs>
I guess I better not put this thing in because I really don't know how to operate this thing. I don't know if can become slamming down and you and I'll be out here trying to pry that thing open and get a kid out, <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> well, let me just stand back and let me see if I can get the canopy to close. Oh, okay. All right. I think we can do it. Cool. Okay. I think we can do that okay. Uh, why you get in? <laughs> Big gear back there is going to hold it, so it's not going to fall. Okay, who wants to get in? Okay, yeah. you get in. We won't go through the All whole right, I like that. Push to pull to eject. <laughs> yeah, you can pull that. It might even pop the canopy open. I don't know if the seat will go out though. The seat might shoot you through that ceiling up there. So I don't know. You no, might try. No. You want to try it? I don't know. I'll <laughs> try it. <laughs> don't pull it. <laughs> Bye, Brian. It's been nice knowing you. Watch out. Keep your hands clear. Okay. You're stuck. That's what it feels like in there. You can see there's not an awful lot of room. A lot of room for him. Not very much room for me in there, I'll tell you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can tell what you're saying. You said, let's hear this. You said, can you hear me, right? Well, this is what we practice egress in. And like I said, uh, we used to have one. I, I guess they'd even put a clear canopy in it, but they'll turn the lights out in there. And man, you can hear guys just banging around in there trying to get up. And of course, they won't let you just blow the canopy, which is this handle back here. There's a handle back here, that one right there, that if you pull that handle, it'll blow the canopy off. You don't have to worry about it. You just blow it off. But of course, they won't let you do that. <laughs> what do you have to do? Well, you try to open it manually. But I mean, you try to open it with a normal. It's just a little switch. You can feel a little switch right underneath it here. We'll switch in there, but I just hold it up or put it down. And it, that, of course, won't let you do that either. So then the next thing you try to do is blow the canopy off. And, of course, they won't let you do that either. And then you have to wind it up. And you can, don't put those in. There's a little crank tool right here that you have to use. And I'm telling you, it is terrible to have to do that. But I'm sure that if the airplane was on fire, I could do it real quick. <laughs> okay, crash up my You want to get in there? Yeah. Come on. Okay. All right, just take and hold, boost yourself over to the side here. That's it. Just stand in the seat. Boost yourself over. Put your, there you go. There you go. <laughs> A little different view here. <laughs> okay, you ready? Keep your hands on your lap now. Bye, Jeremy. <laughs> That's what it looks like looking out. I tell you, he's got a lot more room in there than I've got. <laughs> Is your head right up at the top, Alice? Well, it seems not, like it would no. be. Well, if, if the seat's all the way down, I can I can move the seat up about two inches from the bottom and still not get the canopy. Hit that but, pop canopy thing. Does it just go? Whoosh. Yeah. Well, uh, it, no, if you really did it, if you really did it, if you really pulled the jettison, there are jets under here and on that side and under the front and on the front right side that blow the canopy and the jets fire and take the canopy up and back like that. That's why it says. Pull and run six feet. Pull and bring the line up six feet because it wants to get you away from that canopy that's going to come flying off. Well, why would you just? Because you need to get out of there quickly. If I, oh. like I said, if I, if it's an emergency ground egress, then I get unstrapped in there and I'll open the canopy normally. If it doesn't work, then I'll go to the blow the canopy off, and if it doesn't work after that, then I've got to go through the crank. But this is four inches. No, but remember this. What I did say is that's the way I open it. Side. If I'm unconscious in there and someone has to come in and get me out, this is the way they do it. They'll come up and they'll open this door. They'll open that door right there. And they'll, there's a little D ring in there. They'll pull. And then they'll go running away and the canopy will go off and they'll come and get you me out. You want to pull it while we're happy? Well, nothing probably. I think this canopy would spring up and I would have to get back on the screw. So. Yeah. We've got special kids. We've got specialists that, that know all of that stuff <laughs> that I don't know. All I know is what I have to do to get in and out of this. <laughs> and what you can't do is you get in there. That's right. Jimmy, why don't you get in there? Yeah. Yeah. You feel how you feel how What is it? Jet. Yeah, those are the screws on there on the simulator probably. Doesn't have that little radar, that sight thing. Mm. Like it didn't ha didn't have that like it had on the real plane, that sight thing. Tell you what, it's a mini cord and clock and switch and stuff y'all had to keep it. Yeah, my daddy my daddy came out here when we had when we were in the F four. <laughs> 
Boy, there's a lot of switches in here. So you know what all these things do? And I, no. I know what the ones I know that I need to do. You want to close that camera? Oh, y'all don't, no. don't know what all of them do. Mary Beth, you want to get in? Yeah, I want to get in. Y'all don't know what you do. No, I've got it. Just hold on, make sure you've got a hold of something before you let go of something. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I don't know how you ever get in. Uh, it's, uh, that's like Ooh. I said, that was one of the first things we did. It's Close the most comfortable. Your eyes, kids. I'm going to the wall. <laughs> put, your, put your hands down. I gotta get there fast. Okay. Don't y'all dare leave me. I will find you no matter where you go. You can still open it. <laughs> well, you're the best looking pilot I've seen all day, huh? <laughs> this is not Brian, bad. don't shake the camera. The, the airplane is more comfortable than any I've ever flown because it reclines. The reason they, they claim there she is. is. The woman, <laughs> she survived. Oh, yeah, you have to do jet. it every, yeah, because okay. it's, that's something you don't want to forget. And there he is, like the I man said, the who survived the jet also <laughs> with no <laughs> fuzzy beard. Seeing the light, say, okay, I've got an engine fire now. I've got to move my hands to do the things that, that, that comply and with that. And there he is, or else. So I guess the man who showed us it all. all those what? So I, guess, I said, I guess flying every week you don't use all those emergency well, things, so you'd have to, no, yeah. Wait, wait, time. stop. Stop it, wait. Okay. And there it is. The, the, <laughs> the ugly person named Jerm. <laughs> it's not on. And there it is. Okay, let's go. We take Germs. a look at some of the stuff that we did. This he thinks morning. he's okay. Bye bye. And what they are is either we'll fly air to air combat, either in the uh, range in 4005 and 6, which is out of the Chesapeake Bay, just out east of where you guys live, along here. Or we'll fly out in the whiskey area here, the warning area. There's a area range. This is where we go supersonic out here in any of these areas. Out here, yeah. Nobody's underneath of us. What's all this stuff? These are just maps, of course, that have have uh, what we call warning areas. These are areas right. that are that are um, <clears throat> threat warning areas. That if somebody comes in there unannounced, then the United States would respond to them, and we might be one of the people responding to that. And but these are areas that we we practice in. That's the air-to-air -air ranges. Now the air-to-ground ranges are. Um, uh, one of them is 6609, which is in the bottom part of the Chesapeake Bay down there, Tangier. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, we go down there, two boats down there that you'll see on the tape today that we bombed down there. Uh, down in North Carolina, um, here's the Outer Banks here, of course, and we go to Dare County Range, which is a Navy range to the north and, a, and an Air Force range to the south that has targets on the ground. We go in and attack. Um, here's uh, Warren Grove at uh, Atlantic City, and then Indian Town Gap is uh, right here, just north of Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. Are those targets still out at Tangier? Yep, sure are. One of them's just about blown away, and the other one still looks like a ship. The other one's been hit so many times, it's yeah, not like a ship anymore. The so, down fires on those as well, though. They uh, used to. I don't know what they do. I don't know. It must be big. Not from Dalton, but I, so I'm sure ships fire on them, but I don't know what they do. But is it is it deep there? Because is it said, what? you said it's sticking out of the water. No, it's not ship. deep. It's, it's, as a matter of fact, it's shallow because you can actually, actually see the ship hull is now sitting on the bottom. So it's really not very deep. But do y'all use real torpedoes? No, we use bombs. We use those little blue yeah, bombs. We, bombs. We do, we do put, uh, we do blue put, bombs. sometimes we put 500 pound bombs, but they're concrete Look. filled instead of, instead of with, uh, uh, with explosives. If you, if you would hit one of the ships with those, there'd just be nothing left, right? With a bomb? Oh no, it's, there'd be a lot left. It'd be if we hit it. Well, we're I mean, supposed to hit it. It'd be pretty tough. Though. No, it'd still be there, but uh, it would be. I can tell you, they wouldn't be. Uh, they'd be in pretty tough hurt if we got a bomb inside the ship. <laughs> they are, that'd be a pretty tough. Uh, pretty tough shot. Okay. Um, what I'll show you is uh, is uh, again we flew the mission this morning. We took off from here. So we were supposed to go to. Yeah. Uh, so y'all hit them with the smoke bombs, right? We put them with the little little yeah, smoke, smoke, yeah, little smoke charge with little blue bombs. But again, they fly the same as a real bomb. So all of the stuff you'll see in the heads-up display is exactly the same. The exact, no, they're not the same weight, but they fly the same. And I would release it at the same distance. I'd release it at the same speed. And that would make a difference how much you weigh. Mm-hmm. Make a big difference. It doesn't make any difference because that bomb is designed to fly like the real bomb. Okay, so it doesn't matter in this case, oh, but, uh, but yeah. it's, it, yeah, right, we want it to fly exactly like the real bomb because we don't want to go in there and drop 
practice bombs thousands of times and then go to the war and then say, oh gosh, now we've got to drop it differently. When it goes, when it's time to go, we want to do it just like we've done it thousands of times. Okay. Um, we started out today, we were going to go to Indian Town Gap, we were going to fly a low level in there and simulate a high threat attack and we had a tactic drawn on the board, but that didn't work because the weather was bad up there and we couldn't even get into the, into the range. In fact, it closed because I think the Army's on it. So what we did, we decided we were going to go into the four, into the um, into the Patuxent area range there, and we went in and we went to the boat first. So we bombed first, and then we went up and did uh, intercepts, uh, where I was a bandit one time, and the other guy was a bandit one time, and uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get into. It. Let's see. Okay, we use this. We've, we've got guys here that will spend hours going through these tapes just to make sure and coordinating the tapes because you can imagine when you have a flight of 40, you, you're pulling one tape out and putting another tape in. And, uh, and uh, But I'll show you a little bit. We'll run it through first and then we'll come back. Okay, title, 23 July, Bully, 04, mission number Okay, take title on bully 02. That's today's 1301, take off zero. Say again, what? You know how it does this on the screen? Let me, uh, let me get it on here and I'll stop it now. And you can... Okay? What are you talking yeah, about? These I'm numbers here? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's called my heads up display. That's where, that's, um, get it mm -hmm. over there. That, uh, what that basically does is takes all those instruments down on the instrument panel and displays the readings up in my heads up display right in front of me so I don't have to continue to look down. I can look straight through my canopy and look through that, in fact, at another target. If that were another target at me, he'd be way too close. I'd be real concerned. <laughs> 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 but I'd be able to see how fast I was going when I hit him. Like that. <laughs> Let's watch the tape. What I'm doing right now is titling my tape to let the people that are... I'm gun number 17, and uh, all the rest of the stuff is pretty good. Today is the uh, 13th of August, and uh, the morning go. Tape title out. Okay, now, we, okay, now I'm flying. You can start to see now we're at 9,000 feet, and I can't see the speed. I'm doing about 300, about 370 knots over here. And um, that's where it is. I'm headed to the south, about 175. So I'm headed, I'm basically up here, and I'm headed right down along this piece of land right here. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to see too much. The road really wasn't too bad, too good today. Let's see. All right, let me just. Okay. Hear that sound? Mm -hmm. Somebody's looking at me. Somebody's looking at you. <laughs> You'll hear it a lot better with later on. <laughs> you know who's looking at you? Nope. Eight mile, 30 left, and 15 to 17. Okay. Now we're starting to get the ground. Now I've selected. The ground display. This is the, now the radar is looking at the ground, and you can see. Well, here's not Tangier, but whatever it is north of Tangier. There's the coastline going down, and we'll get down into here. You know, uh, actually, no, I'm, I take that back. Here is um, this is Tangier right along here. That's that's Tangier, and my cursor is right over top where the boat is. The boat's out in the middle there, just off the Tangier Island. This is the rest of the eastern shore down here, probably Cape Charles is down here. Yeah. Okay. So let's go and look a little bit more. I'll just let this go through because I could spend hours telling you all the little stuff. Okay, here's a picture just barely down to the left there. You can see a Tangier. I did a lot of talking today that I normally wouldn't be doing. Okay, I got the target in sight right now, and it's not good on my radar, but uh, I can see it also. Interesting, you need to clear it. These cursors are so big that you can't really see the target. over here to that. You might see it in a second. Okay, I just went to heads up. Now, see, I can select. I can select whether I want it to see my radar scope or whether I want it, the, the film to see outside, which is now we're looking outside in the heads up display. Okay, you wanted me to clear the left boat? Okay. Get back here and see it. Okay, there's my leader right there. You can see him moving away. See him? 
Yeah, we'll see a lot more of that, I hope. When we went in there, there was a guy fishing just off of the, the western boat, the one we were going to bomb. Oh, no. So when we go in there, you know, when we make a pass, those guys are supposed to start those boats up and get out of there because they know we're going to be coming in there bombing. So uh, <laughs> he did, but he was really trying to tempt his hand a little bit because he started up went to the southeast, which would have been right across our pull-off path, and if he'd have, you know, if he'd have stayed there, there's potential we could have dropped the bomb out there on him. Yeah. Of course, we can't do that. We can't even drop it because anyone anywhere near the damn thing we got the, the thing we got to get away from and not not mess with it. So he cranked up finally. So anyway, we switched to the east boat, which you'll be able to see is hardly anything left of it. Okay, one's turning base for the east boat. <laughs> like, when, when can you drop the bomb on it? When, in, in just a second, I'll, tell, I'll show you just a second here. Okay, I'm just selecting my area of ground now. I'm still in single, I'm going to go arms now. I just went to arm, that means I'm just saying, alright, I'm going to get ready to drop something on somebody. I don't see the boat. Well, you won't see it yet because I haven't rolled in yet. Okay, I'm on base leg right now. Okay, here's the way we bomb. Here's the target. Well, here's the boat right here. Okay, it's like a boat. And this is this is the way we came up. There's another little pile over here, and we came across this, and then went to a down wind out here, and so we're turning in. And I've just called base. I'm right here. He's just called in, so he's right here. He's just turning in to come down and start his attack on the boat. Okay, and I haven't started mine yet. So. You'll see the boat just, well, you won't see this very good because uh, I tell you, man. Okay, I'm starting to speed up now. I'm doing 400, 410 now. That's Tangier you're looking at right there. Okay, you can barely see it right here. That's the target, but uh, it's uh, again, it's barely imperceptible. I mean, it's barely perceptible. And the better boat is over here. We'll dump it. I'm supposed to be at a thousand feet. I'm supposed to be speeding up to 450 knots. That's what we're going to deliver at. We've got a little bit of wind from the southeast. Okay, you can see his bomb smoke okay. right there. Okay. okay, see that black dot up here? That meant I just pushed the button, let that bomb go. Usually there's a sound, but this one doesn't have a sound. But you can see that, that black thing right there? When I push that button, it's called a witness mark. Right. So that when we come back to assess the tape, I can see when that thing goes on where my pipper placement, my pipper is just at the base of the target. Uh -huh. And, you know, I'm basically at a thousand, there's a thousand, well, I'm at 900 feet, and I'm a little bit under 450 knots, which ain't bad. Okay, but that's where the target, that's where, the, where we call that the death dot, and that's called putting a thing on the thing. And when we press that button, the bomb will fall and hit that target. I was a little bit short on the first pass. And I'm going to try to lock him up here. Just see if I don't see if I lock him up. What is that line coming down from? Is that the short? It's called the bomb fall line. It's called the bomb fall line. And if I track that line right across the target, ultimately that little square, that little circle is going to be up to the target. And that's what I'm going to push. And that's, that's where the bomb's going to get where that target's going to be. Okay, I locked him up. Number two, there he is. One cat just locked him up. So I got a lock on him. Then have where all the lines are. Okay, well, there he is, right there. You can barely see him. I mean, I mean, you can see, see, see that box back there. There's another thing that we have now that we never had before. When I lock a target up back there, in my heads up speed, display that little box will come out and there's going to be a target inside that box so instead of me having to go out there and strain my eyes looking looking this way and that way that little box will be around my target and that's a there's a there's an old saying in fighter pilots called uh, lose sight lose fight and that's uh that's the key word you can gain visual with him before he gets it with you you've got a big advantage yeah you had a question i was saying that um how does a computer know that that's your target how does the computer doesn't, but uh, if I'm, uh, the computer doesn't know. It just says, all right, you've asked me to lock that up, and that's what I'm going to lock up. I, I need to know whether it is or not. Okay, we'll take a couple more looks at this next speaker. CCRP, 
I'm going to do a little bit better pass on this one, I think. See the smoke trail there? Mm -hmm. You can barely see this. These are real hard to know to look at. Boom, there's my pickle that time. See, I remembered that the bomb hit short and to the to the, uh, to the the right a little bit. So I said, all right, I'm going to get smart this time. I'm going to come in, I'm going to put the pepper a little bit to the left, and I knew that the wind was blowing that way because the smoke's trailing off that way. So you use a lot of things to tell you what's happening out there. Okay? All right, let's see, I'll go lock him up one more time, then we'll, I'll get you a look at the last, because we, we fired on the last, the, the last two were on the boat, on the, uh, big boat. We're going to do a dive bomb pass, so we go up to 20 degrees. Did any of you hit the boat? Yeah, we all hit the boat. Mine was, look, mine was about uh, 10 feet short. Okay, now... Up a little higher. This is going to be a diving pass rather than a flat level pass. Five thousand feet, or is it? Yeah, five thousand feet. We wanted a base at six thousand. Three thousand foot pickle. I'll be looking forward. Here's the boat. Some little X up there. Which? Which little X? Oh, it's, it's going out at, what do I call it, screen right there? The top of the screen? Mm, I don't it's know what it was. It's a circle with an X. A circle with an X? A circle and it had like an X coming through it. I don't know. Oh, I, oh I, it probably was the, the, uh, probably was the uh, target box, and because it was out of the HUD field of view, it had an X. I mean, it says you, here's, the, here's where the target is, but it's out there somewhere. It's not exactly over it. Diving this time. Ah, that it's a, those were both good bones, and it, it, you can't see very much in the dive here. It's just not much. Uh, I will show you the other boat now. Yeah. And those two dive tosses. Delivery, this is delivery where I actually pull off the weight. Oh, is that? Is uh -huh. that shit? Yeah. Right. This, is a, this is a delivery called dive toss where I actually get a lock on the target a long ways down and then I pull up and the bomb comes off and flies in. And uh, it's called dive toss and I'm tossing the bomb. Oh, there it is. The steering line is off line. It's called off line, I couldn't see him. Okay, that's a show the area of stuff. This is all. But those are examples of what we come back and we can tell whether we've done good or not. So, do y'all usually come back from every flight and critique yourselves on? No, well, every every guy's like he won't stay as long as others will because I got to go to work a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus I'm older than the hill too, so they don't make me stay very long. <laughs> okay, let me get over here. We'll set up on. Uh, well, why are they not as clear as some pictures? Um, why are these not as clear as some that you saw? Well, because there's haze. One thing I'm the airplane uh, pointed in different places, clouds around. This is not a particularly good picture. There's something better. Plus, the sun wasn't out very good either. So. What time was okay. this? This morning, we took off at 8.24. Okay, let me go back here a little bit. Okay, here's an air to air radar line. Here, that would take this one. Oh, yeah, that's a screen. That was a good one. What is it? I've got him locked here. Where, what is? Oh, that, that's the target box. That's where my, that's where the guys on got locked up. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about that little story that was always moving all around. Okay, I don't yeah, know it's inside that. the box. Yeah. That's a diamond there, that little diamond? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what that is? That's, yeah. that's my missile, that's where my missile head is looking right now. I've got it slaved to that box. In other words, if I lock a target up, the missile head will automatically go to that box and will, so my missile is already looking at that guy. 
Now, if I reach down and push this little button on the top, you'll see that you'll see the diamond expand, and then you'll hear you'll hear a grrr, and then it'll go wee. That means it's in self track, and I can then fire the missile if I want to. I wouldn't fire it here because I'm way out of range here, but uh, but at least I can. And that's that's what you're looking at. That's where the missile head is looking. That's where my. You try to get the box in a circle, right? No, you Why just not? you let the box go where you want it to, where the box is. You want to keep, keep it out in front of you if you can, but uh, you just uh, you don't try to get the box anywhere. Just yeah. uh, that just tells me that that's where the guy is because I can't make him go where I want him to. Mm -hmm. I can make him be where I want him to in front of my airplane. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, we're setting up for uh, interception now. And what we were, what we were going to do, uh, we worked in the area here, and uh, we were going to split the area. Um, the guy I was with was going to come up to the north area, and I'm staying down here to the south area, right along the bank here. And we set it up so that I was going to be the I was going to be the fighter the first time, and that meant that I was going to be the guy that was simulated going into a target, and he was going to be the bandit, and he was going to be the guy that was going to come and attack. Him. So when I when when I finally picked him up, I was supposed to run a maneuver that was to try to deceive him or get away from him, and um, and so that I could uh, at least defeat his attack and get me in a merge position where I could actually work against him or, or, or fight against him. It's, it, it, that's a real, it's hard to boil down all of that into one simple phrase, but we were just getting apart and, and he was a bad guy and I was a good guy. Okay. I'll show you this. Uh, well, I, we didn't take any shots, so it's hard to, but you can tell, you can tell whether I was in the right parameters, in range, right aspect, Good missile tone, uh, all of those things will tell you whether it was a valid shot. Yeah. Okay, right now I'm just holding at the down at the south end until he gets up to the north. Give me a little bit door if it's getting warm. You want? I'm okay. He probably is in that door. Yeah, he's doing that place and he probably is running up. Okay, all right, now we'll get ready to start. Okay, the Duster and Bully Wildplane will be working from uh, 10 to uh, 15,000 feet. What's the show in there? Okay, just a second, I'll... Uh... Okay, I'm coming down. I've got a track over here. Let's see what I've got right. here. Let me take that. I've started north now. Started, we've started our engagement now. He's about 30 miles away from me. And these are all targets here. These are airplanes flying around here. This little thing right here is what we call the bullseye. That's where a predetermined place that I've set in, in fact, bullseye is right here. I put that artificially into my airplane, so that's where I want anything that comes below there, I want to jump on. That's the line of death right there. And we call it bullseye plus. And it also gives me, it gives me a reference that I can move these things. Remember I told you about locking onto a target mm -hmm. where I put the little, little uh, the, what we call the cursors? These are cursors, these little boxes right here. And right now, you'll, when we turn it back on, you'll see these numbers jump around, and they'll jump around relative to where this thing is. So it's telling me, here's bullseye, which is the middle of the area, and right now, my cursors are right now positioned 308 degrees for 15 miles from that bullseye. So I know where I'm going. Now, when I'm, if I've got another guy, and I say, okay, I've got a contact 308 for 15, he can make his numbers down here read that, and his cursors will be over that target, too. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a relative position. Yeah. And these are targets. Now, I've just looked at this guy over here and said, well, is that my man? Hmm, I don't know if he is or not. He's not where he's supposed to be, but it might be a guy. And I know there's some guys over here, and you'll see me search a couple of targets. Okay. That's him right there, actually. Contact on target. Contact is not target. That's right. Two, one, three, four, uh, all those little boxes are targets. Well, they're, what you said. well, yeah, they, yes, yes, they're targets. Um, what are those little things that are? These are called chevrons, and that's, that says, my radar is telling me that there's somebody out there, electromag, like another radar out there, that's okay. emitting a, 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 a signal. I don't know what it is, but I know it's out there. So what I could do is shoot my little cursors up there and try to lock those chevrons up and might find a target underneath of them, but I don't know. So I haven't really figured that out. I know he's supposed to be out here somewhere, so I'll, I'll just be kind of patient here for a while and see what I find. See, he just made a call. He says, uh, I got a contact at 215 or something at, uh, at, at 8,000 feet. Well, I knew that wasn't me because that wasn't where I was. I, you know, I want to make sure that he knows so he doesn't go running against somebody that's 
he's not, it might be an airliner, it might be a fish spotter, it might be a lot of other people we don't want to be running against. <laughs> you kind of be kind of disconcerted to be a fish spotter out there and see an F-16 come blasting across the <laughs> Okay, there it looks like you just turned to me, so I'm going to go lock him up. All right, I just locked him. See, I just when it went to a diamond, it just went to a, let me get a good frame here. There, okay. What's a diamond mean? Diamond means that I've just locked that target up. I'm going to call the situation awareness lockup. That says, yeah, I've got that guy locked up, and I can tell what he's doing. I know he's 0 to 8 for 10. I know he's 6,000 feet. And I know we're closing at each other at 839 knots. So we're each going over 400 knots. And you know that's a plane? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I sure do. And it feels you know, like if you lock in, like on a fishing boat, it's say 0 up there for the sake of the No, it wouldn't lock a fishing boat because it's not going fast enough to be even uh, on my scope. My, my scope will say, Shh, that guy's not even going fast enough. I know that's not an airplane. That's what my radar is telling me. And in just a second, you'll see a target block come up here that has a lot of information on it. Oops, okay, there it is. Okay, now I know he's a good, I know it's a target now because here he's, it tells me not only that here's the target, that's his altitude, but he's headed 240, that means he's headed southwest, and he's doing 600 knots, so he's going real fast. <laughs> yeah. And I know that his aspect is 150 degrees, that means he's looking at me at about like that, instead of like that at zero. He's looking at me like this, called aspect angle. Have you seen the F-16 uh, game on the uh, computer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called Falcon. That's uh, It talks about all this stuff in there. And uh, you know, it's called an aspect angle there. So that's, that's my target right there. Now remember, I'm the guy trying to deceive him, so I'm not going to be attacking him directly. In fact, what I'm going to do is turn away from him for a while to try to trash his lock or break his lock on me. And then I'm going to come back to him and try to pick him up and shoot. So let's see what happens. Here. Two five five thousand feet. Oh, yeah. What little plus? I mean, that little. This. This little X is going. Oh, it's going plus. Oh, It tells me I got to fly. It tells me I got to fly that direction to have a head-on collision with it. It tells me what direction I've got to do to get my best intercept. I'm not going to get seen at all. Okay, I just turned this way away from him to get him a little bit. I want to get away from him a little bit because uh, I think I can. I think I can work with him, and if I if I think I can work with him, I want to get away from him a little bit to get what I call what we call turning room. If I don't think I can work with him, I think he's tougher than him, I'm going to go as close to him as I can so I don't give him turning room. So it's a, it's a, again, you want to get that book in that computer game if you like computer games. Okay, you hear that noise? Like, that means he's looking at me and he's locking me. Do you have those things that um, means it had radar lock, radar lock, going out those? Sherman? Mm -hmm. What do you think those were, like ships or something? No, they weren't, they weren't anything. They won't come up on my scope because they're not moving. They have to be moving at a certain speed, even my radar to even look at them. They won't even look at them unless what, they're moving. What do you think that was? That was radar? Mm, probably him emitting a radar. If those little chevrons come out like this, yeah. that says there's somebody there and he's emitting a radar energy. I, mean, I don't know who it is there's and I can't see a good target. The the yeah, yeah, that happened a lot of times. Oh, I mean, there were a lot of airplanes out there. We had, oh, yeah. we had, yeah, we had two other guys working air combat above us at uh, ten thousand and below. And above, we had ten thousand and below. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Let's see. What Going to ACM blue. Check. Broke lock. <laughs> he didn't wasn't very happy that I broke his lock. <laughs> 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 Okay, he just said, no joy. I said, continue. That means that don't worry what you've got. I got you in sight. And then it's my ball game next. So that was fun. Thank you. It's, always nice. it's always nice to be able to say, continue. <laughs> <laughs> What's that little snake thing? Well, that's a, that's a, if I were tracking another airplane. Terminate. Terminate. 
do is, ter is terminating uh, dispatches under your nose. What that is, if I if he were out in front here and I were tracking that line we're going across, that means that's where my string of bullets is going. Uh, if I that's on top of his airplane, I've got that little witness mark on up here with my trigger squeeze, and bullets are going to be going into his airplane. So that string is for your arm. I tell the fighter again, so that means I'm falling iron and just going on. Is that little thing? Is that you? Nope. Remember, that's that's that pre-designated death line of death place that I talked about. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to use it like that? Because I was turning real oh. fast. I was turning real fast. See, like that little, that little yeah, happy cake we call it. Um, if I'm coming around here turning like that, then, then it's, it's going real fast across my head. Has he passed it yet, that line of death? No, I haven't got it. Well, I've got it. Yeah, there he is right there. Here's my radar. Sweet, sweeping back and forth. Under two is a two, one, three for ten. There he is. They're logging up, yeah. There he is. Okay. So I got him 026 for nine off of this thing right here, 6,000 feet, and we're doing, together we're doing 924 knots. So he's nine miles away from that? He's nine miles from this little dot yeah. right here. That's right. That's exactly right. He's on a bearing of 026, slightly to the northeast. Mm -hmm. so you just got to contact 025 for nine, 8,000. It's going to take a long to do a mile. Mm. No, because see, I'm doing 450 yeah. knots. So, 480 knots is 8 miles a minute. Just got a contact 13 miles. 2 miles. Okay, now I'm coming down to 12 miles. Now here's 10 miles right here. Alright, you can land right there. Alright, you're going to land Up. That's uh, warning me that there's somebody that's got well, to have something like a beat. I don't know. Just choose that sound. That's the one I don't like to hear. <laughs> it's an irritating sound anyway. Take the head where we had one where we had engaged the F 15s and the F 18s a couple of times. You've seen some good gun camera film, but I don't know where they got the tape. Did you see a little F 15 or a little F 18 underneath of those firing lines? And that was a, that was a fun tape to watch, too. But we get an awful lot of information and practice out of these things because uh, we basically can come back and reconstruct the whole mission off of these tapes. So, but that's about it. What kind of questions you got? Most of them are in the film. Huh? <laughs> what? I asked most of them during the film. Uh huh. Well, that's uh, what we did is an awful lot of fun, and uh, I've been doing it now for a long time. I had, uh, I guess I've got about 3,700 hours of flying now, Gosh. all of which has been in, fi in fighters or fighter type airplanes. Have you ever had to fight? Mm, I was in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. in, oh, in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Vietnam. So, uh, how long were you active? Before you went in mm, about five years. Was that right out of college? Was that no, you I worked for two years in Washington before I went into the Air Force. And then uh, I, uh, when, I, gosh, when I came back from Southeast Asia, it didn't look like there was any need for fighter pilots around very much, so I decided to get up. And then I had the opportunity to come to this guard unit that was flying the F 105 then, and I jumped on it because I could you know, really carry on another career and still get to do this as it was much as I wanted to. Yeah. Well, I, like I told you, I usually fly at least twice and sometimes three times a week. Do they ever give you, like, playtime? Playtime? Yeah. Play time? Play time? Yeah. 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 Y
playtime? Mm, don't give you playtime, but sometimes what, what will happen is if I'll go out and say a flight of four, and for whatever reason I might have an airplane problem, okay, mm -hmm. that something goes wrong in the airplane and I have to take, get out of that airplane and get into another boat. The mission, if I can't make the mission that I'm originally scheduled for a lot, for a lot of times they'll just let me go out and fly and, and uh, I'll go out into the area there, uh, out of the Chesapeake Bay and do acrobatics, you know, do loops and animals and jump on any of the guys out there. No, I can't go as fast as I want because I can't go above the speed of sound, remember? Oh. Even out in the home, bay? Not in the bay. Mm -hmm. No, I can in the ocean. If I go out to the ocean, I don't go out there. Sometimes I'll go out to Ocean City and just fly up the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Oh. Oh, I'll go to Ocean City and fly. Well, I don't fly right up the beach, but uh, out off the out of the water a little bit. But that's the fun little why thing. Could, why couldn't you stay in bed? Um, why could, if you're in the bay, why couldn't you go to Speed of Sound? Because it's over a populated area, and when we go to Speed of Sound, remember that big boom happens and it breaks people's windows and mm. people's chickens stop laying and a lot of other things. So <laughs> nothing good happens when it breaks Speed of Sound. <laughs> <laughs> nothing good happens outside the airplane. Something good happens to you, but. Uh, well, what do you say, guys? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Say hey to Nan before I cut Hi. this camera off. Hi, <laughs> Nan. <laughs>
That wasn't a very nice thing to call your uncle. <laughs> How shameful to even suggest that. What did he call Surely you? Surely he wasn't talking about. Slob. Alex. <laughs> Gun it right now and leave you in the morning. Mom told me a riddle they made about you. That's right. You, you keep reminding me that. And the closer we get to Christmas, it's more unfortunate. I was just telling him. Tell yes, him. I know. You don't have to remind me of unfortunate history. Your mother's supreme life. Do, you know, do you know that riddle? What sort of riddle is that? Uh, Boys. <laughs> Name it, Uncle Bob. Say it. Say it, Mom. Say it. I'm Bob like, slob, corn oh, on the cob, e legged, I legged, bow legged, Bob. <laughs> You're the instigator. <laughs> hey, I just want to. In a say court of law, it. you bear more culpability than she does. You egged her on. So. They okay. choose. She would have done it. It's not a crime. Bruises my ankles and my feet. Yeah, if they have a fight right here in the middle of the boat. <laughs> then I'll throw baby overboard. Because Alex is a good puppy. Whoever starts it, I'll throw overboard. You're starting it. You're the one who gets thrown overboard. We'll make you walk the plank. Now, hand me the camera, Mama. I would like to film. Please. You're through please, filming. Mom. Please. Please. No move, Alex. She gets now, her. can I see the camera now, please? No, because I've gotten all this on tape. It's really interesting. Who's baby? So just leave baby alone. Hey, baby. 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 There's the baby. Alex? Yeah. <laughs> Start going fast, tell me so I can make sure, baby. Look at Alex, look at Alex. Alex! Watch this. Look at Alex, Mom. I've looked at Alex. Alex is sweet. Look at Bob. 